nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Today we'll be talking about the IV characteristics of the MOSFET. Uh, this is lecture 35. We have uh, five more lectures to go before the end of the semester, so it's almost over. But at the same time, towards the very end, of course, we talk about slightly more difficult things, more complicated things. And, but given the background that you have based on previous classes, I hope these will not be as difficult. So we'll be talking today about MOSFET, NOST MOS capacitor. MOS capacitor is a two-terminal device where you have a gate that could be a metal, oxide and the substrate without the source and drain contacts. Uh, but today we'll put those source and drain contacts in there and then try to see the current that flows uh, through a MOS capacitor or MOS transistor structure, metal oxide semiconductor transistor structure. I will not talk about equilibrium anymore. You know how to do a band diagram by now. But this band diagram or this potential profile is slightly different, uh, more complicated uh, than the MOS capacitor or a bipolar junction transistor in the sense that this is a two-dimensional device because, you know, you apply gate bias in a vertical direction. It controls the potential in the vertical direction, but you'll see the current flows from source to drain in the lateral direction. So it is intrinsically a two-dimensional transistor, a two-dimensional current flow. That is something uh, which is a little bit more difficult to think about than uh, the one-dimensional structures before. So in principle, although MOSFET is a simpler device, it's much simpler than bipolar, you'll see. But uh, it is treated at the very end because of the complexity of the geometry. But it's, it's not too bad, you'll see. So let me begin by talking about the so-called subthreshold current. And this subthreshold current, you have already seen. You have already seen, you will immediately recognize after a few minutes that you have done every piece of this calculation when you had been thinking about bipolar junction transistor. So therefore, the math will not be a problem, that the way the currents are handled will not be a problem, uh, but you will see how it's slightly different also compared to bipolar transistors. Now let's get our orientation right. It's very important because I'll be drawing a series of two-dimensional pictures. So it's important that we'll get our orientation right. You can see on the left-hand side, it is a side view where we have taken a cut uh, across the device. This is an NPN uh, configuration uh, for starting from the source is N plus, drain is N plus, and the body or the bulk or the substrate is P. And you can see his gate is on the top. And look at that blue bottom on the substrate where I have contacted it on the bottom. Do you see that with a little, uh, little circular knob uh, in the bottom? Now, the same picture, I have rotated it. It's sort of you flip it towards you and then rotate it a little bit and look at the picture on to the right. And look at the position of the blue line with the knob, which is the substrate contact, the grounded substrate contact on the top. You can see the gate is now facing towards me. The source and drain, do you see that those N plus regions? And the body is P. So therefore, anytime we think about an electron uh, coming from the source to drain through the inversion layer, do you remember that very thin layer, W inversion, 10, 20, 30 angstrom, that region, so the electrons flows from source to drain over there. Uh, in correspondingly, in this other figure on the right, the electrons will flow in the y direction uh, in the same way, exactly the same way, underneath the gate from the source to drain. Very simple. Okay. But now, let's think about the potential, the electron sees, the red electron sees, as it goes from source to drain. Even before drawing the picture, if I didn't have the gate, then do you realize that this looks like a bipolar junction transistor? I have a N plus P and a N plus region. 
So therefore, we expect two diodes back to back, right? With the built-in voltage of VBI in each side, we expect that, right? And we'll see exactly that's what's happening. Do you see that? That if you take a cut and draw the conduction band and the valence band diagrams, you see the flat quasi-fermi level, which is the dotted line. And then you also see that the N plus region is close to the conduction band and the P plus region is the valence band is close to the Fermi level. You can see that. And it's exactly like a bipolar junction transistor, except that this is in the lateral direction in the plane. Bipolar junction transistor is a vertical device where current flows vertically from emitter through the base to the collector. Okay, now comes the difference. Now, if you now take the gate, so there's no voltage applied anywhere. All four voltages are zero in this, in this particular band diagram. Now, if you apply a gate bias, if you apply, let's say, a certain amount of positive bias, so, okay, before that, the electrons, of course, will flow from source to drain uh, from uh, just going over the barrier. This would be like your emitter current going to the collector without base recombination. So that's very similar, very similar. Now, if you apply a gate bias, okay, even before that, I have to, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, if you take a cut, one-dimensional cut just below the gate oxide, just below it, and then they take that blue line and plot it over there, then you can correspondingly draw the conduction and valence band. And you can calculate that height of the barrier from the doping, right? If you have the same material, then the chi will be the same. So simply from the doping, you can calculate VBI. Had it been two different material, and these days, indeed, there are uh, transistors in which source and drain material are silicon germanium, whereas the latest pentiums have exactly that. Source and drain have a different material compared to the bulk, and as a result, you will have a heterojunction over there. And that you can also calculate exactly the same way you would have done in an HPT. Now, if you now apply a gate bias, now if I apply a gate bias, then, and a positive gate bias for that, then therefore, I will pull the whole band down towards in the near the gate side. You see, in both the diagram, I have sort of taken away the gate. I am not drawing the gate part. I'm just looking at what's happening in the substrate. And you can see that the whole band has sort of pulled in. And immediately you can realize, you do realize, that the electrons which are trying to grow from source to drain need not climb up over the whole barrier, but rather they can go very close to the surface. They will go very close. Now they don't have to go over the barrier, so a lot of current can flow, right? So that is the essence of this. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, you see in the back side, in the back side of the device, which would be the substrate side, the potential has not been changed. Why not? Because I have grounded the substrate. Remember the blue with the little knob on the top. Because it is held at zero potential, therefore I have not allowed the backside, the potential on the backside to change. Had it not been clamped by that blue stick, right? So then, therefore, the whole potential would have then come down in that case. But in this particular case, because of the substrate contact, the back side will remain where it is. The front side, because the gate will be pulled down, an electron will flow. Now do you realize this electron will flow very close to the surface? And the amount of band bending, do you know how to calculate it? You do, right? That is exactly equal to phi sub s that we had been talking about. Remember, if you took a cut, a vertical cut through this structure, you would see the back side is an infinity in the bulk and gradually it's bending over near the oxide surface. Exactly, that's how much you know, that's phi sub s. So we, have, we know how to calculate phi sub s for a given gate bias, you remember? And as a result, we can calculate how much the barrier has been suppressed. Once you know how much the barrier has been suppressed, you can correspondingly draw, take the cut, draw it there. Now, is it not beginning to look like a bipolar transistor? Exactly that, right? You forward bias the base emitter junction, quote unquote, and then the current can flow inside. So what would be the, so there will be a certain amount of band bending, and that's band bending is equal to phi sub s, the surface potential, whatever amount you have. And the width of this region, 
for over which the electrons would go, this narrow region over which electrons will go, that is W inversion, right? That is this thin region over which the electron goes. Hopefully, if you have gotten this pieces right, you know, the, then the rest of the things will come easily and naturally. Now, of course, what will happen that just like a bipolar transistor, the base emitter junction has been forward biased, so you will have an extra amount of electron in, that's the green triangle, and on the other side, the, the drain will drain the carriers out, and therefore the carrier concentration would go to zero. And if you do not have any recombination, what do you expect? You will have a linear profile for the electrons, right? That's, that's as simple as that. Not, no, no different than a bipolar transistor. Now, let's now think about that. Let's calculate the current. That under this configuration, when you have applied a large drain bias, or I'm sorry, a gate bias, which has sort of, let's say, depleted the device, but not yet inverted it not yet inverted it, we are still talking about depletion and you can see that's why we say have the gate voltage less than the threshold voltage. You see Vg minus, Vg is less than V threshold and we'll call this sub threshold region, right? Vth is th threshold, so it's below threshold. So we are talking about gate voltages in that range and we are still talking about here drain voltages which is not too high. You see that, that uh, dotted lines are a little bit forward bias. It's not a huge amount of uh, bias yet, the drain side. So in this configuration, what should be the current flow? Well, you should, you should be now be experts in this. So the drain current should be Q multiplied by dn, and this will be small dn dx. And if you do not have any recombination, then you will have Q1 minus Q2 divided by the channel length. Channel length is the, compared to the bipolar, it's like the base width, right? Base width and channel length is exactly the same thing in this configuration. Now, why Q1, Q2? Why don't I have N1 minus N2? Is because I'm sort of multiplying with W. See, I, I'm looking, writing current on the left hand side, but I'm really multi, multiplying with the width, mul density multiplied by width. So, therefore, I have written it as Q1 and divided by L channel. So you get the idea. Now, do you know what Q1 is? Of course you do. It's a forward bias PN junction. How difficult can it be? It is Ni square over Na in equilibrium. Remember the minority carrier electrons? That is, that is Ni square. And do you also see Q e to the power Q phi sub s beta minus 1? Do you realize that, right? This is the excess. So that's the minus 1 taken out. But this time, it is not QVG beta. Beta is 1 over KT, by the way. It is not VG. It is phi sub S because when you apply a gate voltage, the whole thing doesn't come to the surface. Remember in bipolar, your contact base was touching the base, semiconductor. So whatever voltage you applied on the base, the same amount was pulled down by the base contact. But here you have a little oxide sitting there. So therefore, a bunch of voltages or a fraction of the voltage will drop across the oxide and the remaining part will come across the come across the semiconductor. That's phi sub s. So you get it. And W, W is the physical width of the transistor. Remember, I'm just looking at a cross section. Of course, there is a certain width. That is W. W inversion is the thin region over which electron is flowing. So W minus W inversion, that's the cross section over which the thin layer of rectangular layer of current is flowing from source to drain. That's a constant, so then let's not worry too much about it. Now, if you plot this drain current, if you plot this drain current as a function of phi sub s, let's first start with phi sub s, then do you realize that the current will go exponentially up, right? It will go exponentially up. That's exponential current. And this is called the sub-threshold regime. What's going to happen if phi sub s begin to reach sort of the VBI, then what will happen? If the barrier is gradually, gradually decreasing, what happens in a diode? Do you remember the ambipolar region, the high injection region? Do you re remember that? That's exactly what's happening. You can see, don't you remember this region 1, 2, 3, 4, and all sorts of region we discussed? This is exactly that same curve, just plotted in a different way, because you can see 
that the rate curve is rolling over, sort of the high injection regime. The difference between a bipolar and a MOSFET, at least in this context is one of the differences, is that in bipolar, we generally operate in the linear regime where it's increasing exponentially. We don't want to be in the ambipolar regime or high injection regime. It turns out in MOSFET, we do exactly the opposite. We really operate in the high injection regime, above threshold. And, and that's where we'll be operating. But let's start by understanding the below threshold part exactly like a PN junction. No difference. You can see same curve. Now, one thing is phi sub S I do not know. Right? But I have to calculate. But do you remember in the last class I was saying that phi sub S, the amount of surface potential, you could take Vg and just divide by this body coefficient M. The body coefficient, I said that is, you know, 10% to 40% of uh, more than uh, compared to phi sub S. That will give you Vg. So M is 1.1 to 1.4 in modern transistors. So in fact, you can see that if I somehow could calculate phi sub S in terms of Vg, the gate voltage, which I know, then I could easily have written ID as a function of Vg. Now, this slope is a very important slope. It's called a sub-threshold slope. Of course, below threshold is slope. Of course, it's a sub-threshold slope. And you realize that what should this value be, sub-threshold slope? If the y-axis if the y-axis is in log, not ln here, log, you know, factor of 10 increase, then do you realize that this should be, what should it be? 60 millivolts per decade. Why? In a ln, every change in one, or this one volt change in, um, one volt change in phi sub s, essentially increases the current by an order magnitude. I'm sorry. Uh, for beta, if the beta is, let's say it's, 26 milli electron volts, right? Beta over Q is 26 milli electron volt. So if your phi sub S changes by that amount, one order current will change uh, because this is exponential. So you'll have to multiply with 2.3 because the convert between log and ln, and that will give you 60 millivolts per decade. Now, this is something very important and a big fraud. In, in one of the biggest fraud in this, uh, uh, in, the, in probably in science in last uh, 20 years was found out exactly by this. Because one of the very young scientists named Henrik Schoen, uh, he was probably, when I, he was in the Bell Labs, few doors down from where I used to work. Um, he essentially um, was producing a series of fantastic results. You know, science and nature, these are very important journals. And he was getting one or two every few years, it'd be considered a mark of a very important work, right? very distinctive work. Now, this person was writing two or three or four science papers every year. He was 27 years old. He was being considered for one of the directorship and he had the offer for Max Planck Institute, you know, they have five directors, I think. I don't know exactly how many they have, but he is one of the youngest. He is supposed to be one of the youngest. Everything attached was gold. And what happened? One time there was a paper published in which the slope of this curve, of course, physicists generally don't pay attention to this. It looks a nice curve. Transistor is working. And one of the electrical engineers noticed that this is not 60 millivolts per decade. Even in ideally, for an organic transistor he made, even ideally, it should not be below 60 millivolt. This is the lowest it can be in this particular case. And therefore, that started a whole series of investigation. So when you go back home today, Google under Hendrik Schoen, and you will see the whole thing came crashing down. It turns out the 72 or 73 papers he wrote, he didn't do a single experiment. It was all out of thin air. He essentially published it, went through the reviews and everything, and so there is a documentary that is coming out, two, three books coming out this year. And so that was a very interesting story that how simple observations of simple things can make a huge difference. But let's go on to the, the story of more mundane story. I'll tell you the full story later on. Now, these are the experimental car. You can see in the y-axis, I have it in terms of log. And in the x-axis, uh, we have it in terms of VGA. And if you take a slope of this line, they call the subthreshold slope, then that would be 
always greater than 60 millivolts per decade. One order of increase in the current, you need at least 60 millivolts at room temperature. Now, where is that factor M come from? I explained that to you a few days ago that this oxide capacitance and the semiconducting capacitance, you have to take the ratio that gives you the factor M. I have explained that to you just to remind you that the M uh, would be in the ratio of X naught the oxide thickness and WT the doping. So you realize that the body coefficient will depend on the doping through the WT and the oxide thickness. Of course, what would have happened if oxide thickness is zero? Then M becomes one. Then phi sub X equal be equal to the VG because you know you don't have any oxide. So of course, the hundred percent of the voltage should appear across the uh, across the uh, ga uh, gate contact. Okay, so one can calculate it and then you can correspondingly plot that. So, now let's, let's talk about the more important part of super threshold characteristics. This is above threshold. This part we didn't pay as much attention. Uh, so we'll be calculating current and I'll be proving a series of formula. It's not difficult, but you'll just have to pay a little attention. So the current, I'll explain what this is. I'll formula is in a second, but the thing is that somehow I must be able to calculate the W, uh, the mu effective, you know, the mobility. I'm not explaining the formula, I'll do that in a second. But the more important thing is that I will have to calculate the inversion charge, inversion charge QI, that's the blue, as a function of voltage, integrate it over between zero and VDS, the drain voltage I have applied and that will give me the current. I have not explained it, I will do that. But the thing is, the bottom line I want to say is that somehow I need to calculate above threshold the inversion charge. And there are four approximations. One will be called an square law, where you just get this QI as a function of V by this very simple formula. Now, you, it sort of looks familiar to you, right? Vg minus Vt, you have seen this before. C ox that the charge above threshold is C ox minus Vg minus Vt, you know that. The only extra thing that is coming in is this minus V sitting there. This is coming from the drain. So when you have a drain bias, then you have that extra minus V sitting there. Now a little bit better theory is called a Bartle charge theory. And that has the same Vg minus Vt, but in addition, it has a factor big factor and exponential of Na and a V, 2 phi sub B plus V, all these factors built in, this extra thing, it will be called a bulk charge, bulk charge theory. It gives a little bit better estimate for Q sub I. And this one you can see where the doping might, would play a role, right? Do you see that? In this expression, I have a Na sitting there. What does it remind you, this expression? This is associated with the depletion charge. Do you remember? The top side is look, looking like a W the square root of VBI minus VA. Do you remember that? So this is really accounting for that bulk charge, which in the first one, or depletion charge, which is not being actually taken care of I mean, by the square law. So I'm not deriving it yet, but you get the idea just looking at the equation. Now, many times it's difficult to apply it apply this one. So you want something intermediate and what you can show that the last complicated term can actually be simply reduced to that same bulk body coefficient m. You know, if a few seconds ago we talk, talked about that. So it's essentially the square law, but you account for the effect of doping through that factor m with a simplified bulk charge. Now you can solve the problem exactly also. And of course, Pao and Shah, Shah was a very famous person. He did a lot of work. Um, but do you remember, do you see the second set of authors? This is our, one of our professors, right? Professor Pierre, whose book you read, and, and his student Shields. So together, they have also a very famous, famous, uh, famous exact solution for this MOSFET characteristics. But uh, that is a little difficult. And I will not go to, uh, I will not trouble you with that exact derivation here. It's very good, but not necessary for this introductory course. So let's talk about the effect of gate bias first of all. And what does it do to the potential at a given point? Now, 
again, take a second to get oriented with the, uh, uh, the three-dimensional plot on the right. Uh, you see that the red point where I have shown it, this is the drain. And you see the P region, which is in the bulk, which is the earlobe region. And you expect that between drain and a gate, there should be a depletion region. And that's what is shown on the right. And W sub D, which is on the top, is essentially the depletion. Do you realize why W sub D is so big? Is because it is a N plus P region. Of course, most of the depletion should occur within the P region. So that's what you have here. And then correspondingly, you have a gate on the right-hand figure. And the gate, when you apply a positive bias, that will also be, you will deplete a certain amount, right? Do you remember W sub T or WDM written here? This is the depletion due to gate. And you realize that that depletion is fixed. Why? Because the gate voltage is above the threshold voltage. So it has been fixed and the mobile charges are piling up just underneath the gate oxide. Now, yeah, yeah, just, to, uh, just to make sure that the orientation, you get the uh, notion of the orientation correct. Now let's think for a second about the potential. It takes a little bit, but you'll, you'll understand it easily, I'm sure. Going from the green to the yellow region, do you realize that this is the PN junction that is, I'm going over the potential, and now if I had done the source side, it would have come down. It would come down on the side. So that is the VBI. Do you see that VBI? Because in equilibrium, that is the barrier over which you will have to go. Now, when you apply a gate bias, do you see on the right-hand side, the fourth corner, right-hand cor bottom corner, you have the uh, band bending towards the surface. Do you see that? And that is at what point will it clamp to? Do you remember that no matter what gate voltage I apply, the surface band bending, how much can it be? Approximately equal to 2 phi sub B. Because beyond that point, most of the voltage goes across the oxide. It doesn't go across the body. And if uh, that's the oxide, uh, the lecture that we did in the last time. So the, now do you get the configuration? Then, of course, the electron will flow from the source to drain through that narrow region where it is sort of bending over towards the gate. Okay, so these are the basic configurations, no problem. Now the thing is that in this case I have applied a gate bias, haven't applied any drain bias yet, no significant drain bias yet. Therefore in this case you have a certain amount of depletion, WT, because depletion remember when it happens? when you bend the band enough so that the minority carriers begin to become the majority carriers. Okay, now this is the same set of figures. We'll just focus on the figure on the very bottom. In this very bottom figure, you can see in the beginning you have zero bias, then you have just the gate bias, but in the very end figure, figure in the very end, what do you see? What you see is that you have applied a large amount of drain bias. Do you see that because of the positive drain bias, the drain has been, the drain Fermi level has been pushed down all the way. And that's why the depletion over there is going to be very, very different compared to the source side. Let's, let's try to look at it in a slightly different way. Now this is just, I'm trying to set it up because then I'll do a very simple calculation. So in the first case, looking on the left figure, I have no gate bias, but I have a large drain bias. And the drain bias, the amount is VR. Reverse bias PN junction, right? You, do you see that? That's reverse bias PN junction. Now, if you apply a gate bias now, then of course you can bend the band. But the thing is, do you realize that by bending the band, you cannot have now, with this amount of drain voltage present, we are present, the minority carriers can no longer be greater than the majority carriers. Because you see, you now have a huge barrier for the electrons to climb up through that region next to the gate. And so what you have to do now, if you want to invert this region next to the gate, you will have to apply a huge amount of extra bias in the gate so that the barrier close to the surface becomes small enough again 
so that electrons can climb in. So in the presence of a drain bias, we realize our gate bias has to be significantly more. Or if we keep the gate bias the same, our induced charge will be significantly less compared to what would have been the case if we didn't have a drain bias. So if you understood that, hopefully, then let's, let's look at this very simple figure and see whether we can understand it. I am taking a cut for the potential along that red line. Remember, the cut need not be a straight line, right? Cut can be in any line. And that is what I have shown here in a two-dimensional plot. Do you see that when I'm cutting, coming through the top, first I have gate, then I have this blue insulators, and I have correspondingly drawn the bond di band diagram below. Then I have a P region. Do you see the band diagram in the P region, starting in the middle? And then I turn right, and then essentially go to the N plus region, and the correspondingly my band diagram follows suit. So you can see the band diagram has gone down. Now what would have happened if I have applied a drain bias? Okay, if I have applied a drain bias, then correspondingly the, blue, the green region would have been pushed down. Do you see in the middle figure? Do you see in the middle figure that the V, the corresponding the V, the whole Fermi levels have been pushed down. What is that VB doing there, that blue VB? Blue VB is telling me my body field or the body potential, that has not changed. So therefore, the P region has exactly the same potential as before. But the N region now, because I have applied a positive bias, the N Fermi level has been pushed down. Now, if I want to if I want to invert this region now, you realize that I'll have to make sure that my gate voltage is large enough so that it goes under the gate, this red line, because the red line is sort of my majority carrier. And so therefore, I'll have to pull it down so that the electrons can flow. As a result, what's going to happen is that in addition of the standard formula, this QI minus Cox, Vg minus Vt minus V, that, that thing, I also have to account for this depletion charge. Because the amount of region that needs to be inverted, sorry, depleted, WTV, that depends on the gate voltage, sorry, drain voltage I have, and as a result, this extra factor would come in. So let's see how, how it works. On the left hand side, I have just the gate voltage, no drain bias. On the right hand side, I have a gate voltage as well as a drain bias. Let's think about the charge on two sides. Do you agree the threshold voltage on the left side will be 2 phi sub f minus that factor? What is the second factor? That is the potential drop across the oxide, right? E ox multiplied by x naught, remember, that the electric field coming out and dropping across this, and the x naught has been absorbed in the C ox. Right. So we have that. On the right hand side, I have a new potential because I will now need to put more voltage before I can invert it. So I shall have to have 2 phi sub s plus v. Why 2 phi sub s plus v? Because if I don't invert additional v amount, then I cannot be sort of go over the majority carriers on this side. But at the same time, because of this extra voltage, WTV would be the amount of depletion, extra depletion that I have. And so from here, I can write the new threshold voltage to be the old threshold voltage minus this extra thing. Essentially, you subtract one from the other, and that gives you this particular formula. And therefore, the new threshold voltage, you can simply write it as Vg minus V threshold star, because that's the new threshold voltage in the presence of a drain bias. Now, that's the whole formula I have. And now do you realize where the, where the bulk charge theory, where that comes from? Because WTV is essentially, will be proportional to 2 phi sub B plus V. Right? This is the amount of depletion, and when the drain bias was zero, 
then correspondingly the depletion charge will not have that extra V in, extra potential in. Now you can calculate it. First of all, one way to calculate is drop those two terms. The last two terms looks complicated, drop it. Now if you do that, that will become your square law theory. But if you do a little bit more manipulation, and that is not what I am doing here, you can also show the last two terms essentially at the end, you can have it as a fraction, appear as a fraction m multiplying that v. But that extra derivation I am not doing. But let me just focus on the physics of square law and try to see whether I can explain it to you. Now what happens along the channel that as the electrons goes from the source to rain, then in one side the Fermi levels for Fn and Fp both are sort of near equilibrium because I have not changed the source and gate biases. On the other hand, as I have pumped down the drain potential, therefore I will have the Fn lowered by the amount QVD on the other side and in between the potential will go linearly as from one side to another. Now what happens if potential goes linearly from one side to another? You realize that if my gate voltage is held constant, then as I am approaching the drain, then this V, this effect of the drain bias V, that will gradually increase. Because at every point as it's getting closer to the drain, my full effect of VD is coming in. And therefore, the farther along I go along the drain, less charge I have over there. Because in one case, I'm almost fully in inversion. As I'm going farther and farther, the drain voltage is sort of pulling the point where I need to get in order to go to inversion. So therefore, the total amount of charge will gradually become smaller. And that's what I have shown here the, over there in terms of boxes, the rectangular boxes. That is, you go down the channel, you have less and less charges. Just a quick another view, because this is sort of very important that you understand this, that as you are moving down the channel, on the very left side, everything is in equilibrium, like a PN junction. As you are sort of in the middle, you can see because of the effect of the drain voltage, the Fn has been, which is a dashed line, has been pulled down a little, so it's more difficult to invert. A farther down, closer to the drain, the Fn has gone down even farther, so it's getting even more difficult for the inversion to occur. And finally, very close to the drain, the Fn is even farther down. But you see, in all these cases, Fp is exactly where it was throughout because I have not changed the body contact. It's exactly where it was before. And because these Fermi levels are getting split, you can see that corresponding to the conduction band, the difference is increasing. And therefore, I will have less and less carriers as I move down the channel. So let's make some calculations because I think we are done. So the first thing is, let's take box, four boxes here of the electrons. The first box, J1, the current in J1 will be Q1 mu multiplied by E1, right? Why this Q1? Q is whatever charge you have in the first box, mu multiplied by E1, what is that? That's the velocity. So Q multiplied by V is the current. What happened to the diffusion current? Well, remember that this is a very strong field. This is above threshold. Below threshold, we did the diffusion. Diffusion was the dominant one. Above threshold, it is mostly drift. So that is going through this source to drain by drift. And the E1, you can write is dV dy along the lateral direction in the horizontal direction. That's the electric field along y. And you can write the other four pieces also. Now, do you realize this current has to be continuous, right? Why does it have to be continuous? Because if I assume no recombination, whatever is coming in box number one, that same thing must go to box number two, box number three, current, right? Not the number, but the flux. If they are the same, then I can easily do this. I could sum the left-hand side. And if I sum the left-hand side, divide by mu and multiply it by dy, 
then do you also realize that j, I could pull it out of the sum. It's the same, it's a constant. I don't know what that constant is, but that must be the same constant. So I pull it out of the uh, integral. What is that sum over di, dy? The sum over dy is the channel length, right? Because dy is the boxes. So sum over dy is the channel length. And qi, well, you see that that little formula we derived five minutes ago, that's what is sitting on the right hand side, cx, bg minus vth minus mv. Now, can you integrate this? Well, I'm sure you can, because this is a simple vg minus vt, that's a constant. So when you integrate and put the limit, that will give you a vd, and the second term will be mv squared over 2, and of course, when you put the limit, that will become mvd squared over 2. Left hand side, that would have been an L channel, and that's what I have cross multiplied up and down. And that gives me the current JD. And that's the formula. This is the current for a MOSFET above threshold, not sub-threshold, above threshold region. Now, let's look at this formula. What is it trying to tell us? This, this particular formula is trying to tell us. First of all, this formula is trying to tell us that the current will be maximum at some point and then it will go again, turn over. That's what that formula is trying to tell us. Because if I took a derivative of did as a function of, I'm sorry, that should be as a function, derivative as a function of vd, right? So then there should be, it should, it, I can set it to equal to zero, and so I can have a quantity vd sat beyond which this is what's going to happen. that if I take a start with the, any of the rate curves, you can see that the curve coming to a point which is equal to Vdsat, and you see, look at that formula, Vdsat is Vg minus Vt divided by M, that is exactly the formula that I derived on the top. At that point, this formula is saying that it should come back down to earth, which is like a projectile. And you can see that's the dotted line. Of course, that's not, that's not possible. Current cannot come down like that. You are increasing the gate voltage. So, of course, beyond that point, the theory is unphysical. But the point is that up to that point, up to VD side, that's the correct formula. And it turns out beyond that point, the current is essentially constant. So, that is the solid red dashed line. So, that will be the formula for a drain current for the, from the bulk charge theory, a simplified uh, bulk charge theory. And in the very early part, in the, do you realize that in the very early part, the formula gets simplified to what is written on the very left hand corner in the blue part? Do you realize that? Why is that? Because if Vd is very small, it's a 0.1 volt. Vd squared is 0 0.01, right? So the second term on the full expression, that will drop out. And once it drops out, do you see that you have a linear expression? So at a very low drain bias, we have a linear increase in ID, right? It's a drift current. So of course, it's a register. So therefore, you have a linear increase. But as you go to higher and higher VD, then gradually the curve begins to saturate and then it becomes constant. The constant part is not in this theory. But the full theory uh, will have that. The one that we didn't, uh, Pausha theory or the Pierre Shields theory, those will actually account for the whole rate curve. But in this one, we just have a piece of it. Now, why does the theory not work? Why does it not work beyond VDSAT? Because look at that formula, what the VDSAT point is. VDSAT is VG minus VT divided by M, right? Now, put it back in this formula on the top for the charge. So, M VDSAT, if you put it over there, instead of V on the top, top equation, instead of V, we'll put VDSAT. So M VDSAT is VG minus VT, right? What is that at VDSAT point? This whole charge is zero. If you put it back in, it's zero. If you try to put your VD a little bit more, this whole thing will become negative, right? Negative in the sense that the, the whole thing inside it. But that cannot be. This formula is only valid above threshold. This is not a below sub-threshold formula. So therefore, this quantity, which is Vg minus Vt minus Mv, can never be, can never be negative. That's unphysical because it should always be above inversion. As a result, 
that whole formula which I used to derive that equation, that charge formula is incorrect, becomes incorrect after VD. As a result, you cannot use this formula above the VD set point. You see, that's why. So what happens? Here, the charges in the last boxes, they become equal to zero, depleted, it becomes depleted. And this loss of inversion, this is called a pinch off region. This last region is called pinch off region. So if you don't have a charge, how is it that electrons are going from one side to another? You don't have any charge. So how is current flowing? Well, you have seen this before, many times before. When the base current, or I'm sorry, the emitter current flows over the base, base potential, and to the collector side, doesn't it go over a huge depletion region in the collector? Mobile charges flowing through the depletion region. This is no rocket science in there. Same thing here. Yes, the last boxes are getting completely depleted, but that doesn't mean anything. I mean, the electrons which are coming from the other side, they will essentially simply go over the channel and deplete it, cross the depletion part and go to the other side. Current flow did be just fine. And beyond that point, so at that maximum point where the current become constant, if you put that value of VD sat, then you will correspondingly get an expression which goes as square of VD minus VT. And that's why it's called a square law because it depends on the difference of Vg minus Vt as a square. Now for last probably uh, 30 years, square law has, has not been valid. And I'll explain that in the next class. In any way, one thing that's very important for many characterization is to understand what happens in the linear regime, is a low voltage regime. If you plot it in a linear plot, Ide and Vgs, and for small Vds, then uh, you, you can see that you can easily, for a given drain bias, you can calculate the channel resistance because it's sort of a small drain bias, it's like a large amount of gate bias. So you have a certain amount of charge and so it's behaving like a register. So you can calculate the corresponding channel resistance. And in many experimental paper, you will see that they report the channel resistance, measurement of the channel resistance that you can easily calculate from that expression. Subthreshold conduction is of course very small and from the experimental IV characteristics you should always take a slope, the red line and wherever that crosses that gives you Vt because Vt is something you have to measure. How else can you get Vt? Do you remember? From the CV characteristics. From a CV characteristics remember where the low frequency subthreshold characteristics or depletion goes to inversion. There is a change over there, right? So if I give you IV characteristics, you can also correspondingly take a slope of the right ID versus VGS curve and get VT. And these two results must be the same so that you know that you have the right analysis and right values in there. And once you have the intercept, that gives you VT and the slope will give you the mobility. So that is how you will calculate the mobility of a MOSFET. So let me summarize. So the basic point I wanted to make today was that beyond a MOS capacitor, beyond a MOS capacitor, the way you make it a transistor is by applying a drain bias. Wait, so in order to collect the current. Two regimes are there. One is subthreshold, where the drain bias is small. And another is, and the gate bias is also small. And another is super threshold where the drain bias is very large, at the same time, the gate bias is also large. When you apply a large gate bias, then what happens? That the inversion at every point along the channel becomes little different. And if you look at the electron concentration very close to the source, you have a lot of electrons. As you go closer to the drain, you have less and less and less. And when you want this current to be continuous, that's how you calculate the bulk charge theory or square law theory, that's how you calculate it. So we'll pick up more details of this calculation in the next class. Okay, thank you.